Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Nina Olson. We're back again from the Center for Taxpayer Rights with another one of our tax chats in the Transforming Tax Administration series. And this is going to be a great chat. Uh, the planning call that we had the other day, we could have gone on for much longer, but we figured we'd save some of the things that we wanted to say for you all. Um, the focus of this chat is correspondence exam, and it feeds really nicely from a chat that we did on May 11th, which is now up on our YouTube channel, and also the link is on the website, and I'll also put the link in the chat in a minute. And that was on voluntary compliance, and toward the very end of that chat, not only did Mandy Matlock talk about um, her part of that chat was talking about correspondence exam and the notices and how they kind of looked. And she put up some examples of core exam notices. But also Eric Kirchler from the University of Vienna in Austria talked about some research that he had done with me at the Taxpayer Advocate Service, where we did a nationwide survey of taxpayers who had been audited. And um, these were self-employed taxpayers, a portion of which had had were EITC taxpayers. But we compared correspondence exam audits and office audits and field audits. And one of the things that we asked was, were you aware that you were being audited? And 60% of the correspondence exam audited taxpayers said that they didn't know that they had been audited. They didn't think it was an audit. We're not sure what they thought it was because then they went on to answer questions about how they felt about their interaction. And that was some of the most interesting findings that came out of that particular aspect of the study was Eric is an economic psychologist. And so some of the questions in the survey were about your attitudes both toward the tax system, your feelings about the IRS, your feelings about the audit process, whether you felt it was just, procedurally just. And one of the things that they found was that the largest group of people responded that they felt anger as a result of the audit. And another smaller group, their point was anxiety. And what they really found was the movement toward anger um, uh, and the, any positive attitudes really diminished significantly with the correspondence exam. And for correspondence exam, the strongest negative emotions were that they received, this was not an emotion, but the feeling was that they received no explanation. And then the emotions were feelings of helplessness, resignation, and desperation. So that was a representative sample of sole proprietors who had been audited by correspondence exams. So I just share that with you as an introduction to this panel. Now, we're going to focus a lot on earned income credit, and we have a terrific panel of folks, Janet Holtzblatt, who's a senior fellow at the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, and before that was um, in the, you know, the Department of Treasury Office of Tax Analysis for I mean, I first met her in 2001 and she'd already been there for a while. So Janet has an incredible amount of historical knowledge about the earned income credit and some of the developments that happened and even the origins of correspondence exam. Then we have Justin Schegel, who is, <clears throat> excuse me, Schegel, who is the supervising, uh, supervisory attorney and tax clinic director at Gulf Coast um, Legal Services in Brannerton, Florida. And Justin has been doing some really interesting work with um, FOIA getting a bunch of information as well as bringing his experience representing taxpayers in correspondence exams. And finally, we have Day Manoli, who is an associate professor at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. And he's going to talk about some of the research that he's done in his observations, and then also a research proposal that we have going forward, focusing on correspondence exam. So I'm just going to turn to Janet. Now, you all can put comments and questions, remarks in the chat. We'll all be monitoring your comments and what you want to say or questions, and we'll try to address them as we go along. Um, so, Janet, go forward. Okay. Uh, Nina, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this really interesting podcast today. And I look forward to hear what my fellow panelists have to say and what the audience has to ask or comment. Um, I'm going to expand on my introduction. 
Uh, I worked at the Office of Tax Analysis, which is the economist arm of the Office of Tax Policy at the Treasury Department, unbelievably from 1987 through 2007. Uh, that was a period when the EITC experienced an incredible growth spurt, but it was also a period when the focus on EITC compliance began and the birth of correspondence audits for EITC claimants who appeared to be non-compliant based on the information the IRS had. So my job today is to provide historical perspective, beginning with that incredible growth of the EITC. Um, for many decades, the EITC was that rare program beloved by both Republicans and Dems, Democrats. It was created as a temporary provision in 1975 during the Ford administration, made permanent in 1978 through, during Carter, uh, but still relatively small. And then there was this growth spurt that began in 86 with the Tax Reform Act of 86 under Reagan, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1990 under the first Bush, and then over 1993 under Clinton, Clinton may have been perhaps the first and maybe the only president to tell Rolling Stone magazine that he loved the EITC. That was during the campaign and I was so excited. Um, so if you put that all together, just from 1985, that year before the Tax Reform Act, to 1997, the EITC grew from $2 billion to $30 billion. Now, that's in nominal dollars, but even adjusted for inflation, that's huge. Now, the expansion of the EITC was a major achievement because this became this uh, one of the largest poverty reduction programs. It also offset income, payroll, and to some extent, excise taxes. And on top of it, it rewarded work. And with the 1993 Act, it even provided a small credit for people who are generally ignored by programs. Uh, those who don't have a qualifying child. But here's the thing about getting big, and we see this in Washington, D.C. all the time with political stars. We also see it with programs that get big. It was no longer, the ITC was no longer flying under the radar, and a combination of factors led to pushback from some Republicans on the Hill. Partly that was because it got caught up in the anti-welfare fervor of that decade. Decade was also caught up in the anti-Clinton fervor, um, among some uh, people in the Congress, and compounding and providing support for those first two political forces was the drip, drip, drip of compliance data. Now, the first drip was actually before the Tax Reform Act of 86, and that was with the revelation of data from another uh, research uh, economists that claiming bugs and cats as dependents. And in response to that, uh, the 86 Act had put into place a social security number requirement for dependents, although it only began with kids around the age of five or so. Um, that was followed in 1990. Inadvertently, I had requested from the IRS a table uh, based on the compliance data on hand on the EITC, I was trying to reconcile some anomalies in tax return data and household survey data. And um, much to our surprise, all of us at Treasury and perhaps even within IRS, that data went to the Congress on the same day as it went over to me. Yes, it was painful. Um, and that data showed a 39% overpayment rate for the EITC um, and so forth. And that it also showed, this was the data I was requesting, it also showed some of the factors that were associated with non-compliance and they were mainly related to family status. Uh, and as we'll see, that led to various changes in the EITC. And then there was another trickle of EITC compliance, compliance studies specific to the EITC one in 1991, one in 1994, and 1999. Now, all of this data, the power for better or for worse of this data was magnified by the fact that Congress had stopped funding of more comprehensive compliance studies. This was what was then called the Taxpayer Compliance Measurement Program. The last one was in 1989. Um, one senator um, referred to the 
them as the audits from hell. They were random audits of all taxpayers where everything on the return was subject to intense uh, requests for documentation. The last one in 89 and not until the 2001 National Research Program did the IRS begin to collect compliance data on anything other than the EITC. So unfortunately, all of that contributed to the impression that the EITC not only had a high non-compliance rate, which by the way, was got down to the low mid to low 20% by after the SSN requirements went into place. But it not only led to this impression that the, EIT, that the EITC had this huge compliance problem, but that it was the biggest source of non-compliance in, in the IRS, which absolutely is not true. Um, so with each release of compliance data, uh, Treasury and the IRS worked together on legislation and administrative actions to try to reduce the error rate. And the first efforts were in that 1990, uh, were in the 1991 Act at the same time that the IRS, the Congress expanded the EITC the most. Um, looking at the family data, we, we, <laughs> we, Treasury and Congress came up with a proposed, came up with a bunch of proposals to try to simplify the eligibility for a family to claim the EITC. Back in those days, the requirements for a single parent and for a married couple were different. Uh, and they both required extensive spreadsheets and documentation if caught up in an audit to prove that you either supported the child for more than half the year or you maintained a home with the child for over half the year. And all of that got replaced in 2000, excuse me, in 1991 with a residency relationship and the AGI tiebreaker, where the credit would typically go to the person who qualified for the child and all other ways, but had a higher AGI. That was viewed as simpler for the IRS to administer and certainly hopefully easier to explain and document than the comprehensive spreadsheets for showing support to household maintenance. The other thing was steadily the SSN threshold for dependents was lowered so that in the early 90s, every child uh, was required to have an SSN for the parent or guardian to claim that child is, um, as a dependent or for the EITC. Then the next step was administrative. And this began in 1994 uh, after the last set of compliance data came out. Um, or the most latest that came out. And in 94, and now that IRS had all this SSN requirement, for years, it, even though the IRS had been getting it, the IRS had not been using that data. And so beginning in 1994, to show that Treasury and IRS were serious about dealing with the IRS, not the ATC, audits were commissioned, audits were started. And these were the typical field and office audits. Um, and, 1 million 1995 tax returns were audited just based on the missing or invalid SSN. Uh, that was obviously very expensive. And so in the next year, it was cut down to half. Uh, despite those efforts, you had continued concern among some very highly placed people in Congress on both the House and Senate side who wanted to roll back the EITC expansions of 91 and, 90, and 1993. Um, freeze the EITC at the 1995 parameters, even though there was gonna be a huge increase in 96, and also eliminate that credit for childless individuals. From the administration's perspective, this was one of the landmark pieces of legislation for Clinton. They wanted to keep the EITC from being cut. And they also, this was also in 97, the point at which the child tax credit was going to, was being created. The uh, Clinton administration at least wanted to open the door, get a foothold in the do door for some refundability for the child tax credit. But the deal that was worked out was actually very successful from the Clinton administration's perspective. There were no cuts to the ITC. There was partial refundability of the child tax credit, though limited to taxpayers with three or more kids. The other side of the equation was that um, there would be an increase in the IRS appropriations 
for $400 million above its normal appropriations just for EITC administration. And that was to cover everything from outreach to, excuse me, outreach to enforcement. And the commitment from Treasury in this letter to Gingrich was that it, this would result in an increase in enforcement revenues over the decade by several billion dollars. That letter is somewhere. I don't have a copy and I can't find one online. Um, but I believe it was going to be five billion over 10 years. Now associated with that increase was legislation after the year before the one piece of legislation was to make the invalid SSN subject to math error authority as opposed to an audit. Um, that really uh, meant that the ATC could be hold, held up in processing a notice would be sent to the taxpayer and that the taxpayer could respond without necessarily going through an audit procedure. It was accompanied by some more simplification, due diligence requirements for paid preparers and third party information, improved access to third party information. Now, in terms of enforcement, now that the SSN issue was off the table, uh, there was discussion, you know, between Treasury and IRS as to what to do next in terms of enforcement. And it was in that moment that a proposal was made, I believe from the IRS, because I've never heard of it before, but a proposal was made from our friends at the IRS to adopt a format of correspondence audits with respect to EITC. And it was viewed as achieving two goals. Clearly for the IRS, a correspondence audits would be less labor intensive and hence less costly. And for the dollar, you could get more of those audits done. But we were also concerned, and this wasn't just Treasury or the White House. Uh, there was a lot of concern about from the IRS folks about the burden that's placed on IRA, EITC claimants. Um, and so this was also viewed as a way to minimize hopefully minimize the burden of the taxpayer because they would not, and there's a particular concern for low-income individuals, they would not have to take a day off from the work to go into an office or have somebody come to them to, you know, to audit their return. And traditionally those office audits were like everything on the return, but the correspondence audits were going to be targeted to a few items that potentially had been notice as anomalies in this third party information that the IRS got. I mean, I have to make a comment with respect to the IRS staff. When we would go over to meetings at the IRS, there was a lot of reluctance amongst staff, at least in headquarters, for doing audits on low-income people. This came from both their many people's views that it was just wrong to audit low-income people then you know, in this whole population. And also, um, it was also viewed as a bad look for the IRS uh, in terms of auditing. So low-income individuals. So pretty much an accurate forecast of where we're at now in terms of what inside employees said. But the curious thing is that the groups who were pushing this, I mean, within the administration, obviously, we were working at it from the Treasury, the Treasury Administration, I think then it was Secretary Rubin. The White House was very much behind this. And we also had support from one of the more progressive organizations in town, all of which were viewing this as the cost that was being paid by the IRS and by taxpayers, by some taxpayers, that enabled the EITC to be maintained at the expanded levels of the two legislations. Um, now, the correspondence audits were going to be supported by the additional access to third party information. Um, in that 97 Act, the IRS got, and this was largely with the assistance of OMB, the IRS got access to one, the National Registry of Child Support Orders. And also, the SSA was now going to be required to get the SSN, the Social Security number, uh, Parents, parents would be required to provide their own social security number when applying for a social security number for their child. Now, we knew that there were cracks in the system. With the National Registry of Child Support Orders, that information that would show the custodial 
parent or the guardian and the non-custodial parent who owed child support, that information was only available for those cases where the government was involved. That would include people who were receiving, custodial parents who were receiving TANF and the non-custodial parents' child support payments were partly used to fund the TANF payment. And then two, uh, people who had gone to uh, state government or local government in order to get enforcement of a child support arrangement between the kids. Voluntary child support or support stuff that wasn't the National Registry of Child Support uh, Registry. So that was one crack. On the requirement that SSA get the SSNs of the parents when applying for the child's SSN, there was an obvious crack. We weren't going to have much of that information initially. This was a prospective form of gathering information that as each year more kids came into the system, maybe in 18 years, you would have a huge cohort. And then maybe in 36 years, you'd have the grandparents too. This was a long run strategy. It was only after the enactment that SSA said, oh, gee, we may be able to only get the SSN of one parent. So even going into the future, this was an unfortunate crack. The crack that still disturbs me was our inability to get data on marriage licenses. Uh, we have observed in the, we have observed in the compliance data that there was um, we had observed in the compliance data cases of married couples who strategically to avoid marriage penalties were reporting themselves as unmarried, and hence their income was lower, and hence one or both of them were able to claim a kid in order to get an EITC. But when we tried to get that kind of data, we were told that at the local level. There was a national data at the local level, particularly when you went to smaller municipalities, that those records might be in shoeboxes in the basements of town halls. So sadly, we couldn't get that. So in my mind, that was an unfortunate crack. Um, but the notion was, the great hope was that that kind of information combined with data analytics would enable the IRS to more appropriately target individuals and select potentially the right people for correspondence audits. Uh, my colleagues on this panel may dispute whether that was successful or not, but that was the that was the goal. Um, there wasn't, we hope, to put too much pressure on the error rates. You know, the goal with the letter from Gein, which was a revenue number, which was never verified, but it was a revenue number. There was concern, and I apply this concern going forward with the recent increase in the IRS's budget. There was a concern about putting too much focus on the error rate or going forward the tax gap because those are moving targets. Once you increase detection, or per, once you improve the IRS's ability to detect and go after noncompliance, you're also increasing the amount of noncompliance is detected. You're denominated in these kinds of equations. So you may not be showing improvements, even if there are improvements relative to current law. But in 2002, Congress enacted the Improper Payments Act, which requires agencies to produce annual error rates for large programs. Typically, these are large spending programs, but OMB um, put the EITC on that list. So now we have every year reported in this document on the on the website, an EITC error rate. So that does maintain focus on those numbers. All right, going forward, my colleagues will talk about the problems that have arisen with correspondence audits. And I think that the process can be improved. Um, we've learned a lot and I'm hopeful that we can maintain progress. But speaking from it as someone who cared about the EITC and who saw those battles in the mid 1990s, uh, I do feel like if the objective of correspondence audits and everything else we did propose and try to do for administration in the mid 1990s, if the objective was to protect the EITC from cuts, the, the efforts taken at that time were successful. The EITC was not cut back. There was even, we got even 
there were some permanent smallish expansions of the EITC in this century, and even some temporary but large expansions too. So, you know, my biggest fear, I want improvements, but my biggest fear is never going back to that period in the mid 1990s with the kinds of arrows that were shot at the EITC and um, almost led to huge cutbacks. And with that, I am done. Well, I, that was just so helpful to have that background. And, you know, um, I also feel like I need a drink having gone through listening to all of that um, and feeling- You, some, me too. <laughs> I know, and the memories of some of those things. And, and in preparing for this panel, I went back through my files and came across a really large file with, and I thought it was the 1994, but it were the 1995 Senator Roth hearings. And there were in particular, just a whole series of hearings about the earned income credit and, and the language from some of the folks, it was just very bashing. And I think it's hard for people to realize how much at risk it was at that moment. Um, and and I think that puts some perspective on this. Now, to bring it to another perspective, to see where we are today, and and uh, you know, I, I mean, I had those conversations with folks in the IRS about correspondence exam that this was supposed to be very taxpayer favorable. And as I mentioned, you know, at one point the IRS had people, you know, one correspondence exam was assigned to one assister, one examiner. And they moved from that to doing, you know, the next available assister because they felt that people were calling in response to letters and their assister wasn't available, their examiner wasn't available. So it was a taxpayer favorable thing to say, let's put it on our joint operations center call, you know, the next you know, a sister that's available, you get. So then you move from one person working the correspondence exam to there's no one or everyone working the correspondence exam. And, you know, the problem with that is that, yes, you may eventually get through to someone, but the notes on that case, it's not like an office exam where somebody's responsible for their own notes and people are really reviewing that particular case. It could be miserable notes. You don't know what's gone on before. So, Justin, let me turn to you so you can talk through, you know, both what it's like, but also your your the results of some of the FOIA research you've been doing. Yeah, sure. If I can figure out how to share my screen. So, I I really appreciate Janet and and Nina having um, this this background because I'm still relatively new to this. And I see how it works now. And um, when I describe some of the stuff that goes on to my wife, who is, uh, she's in civil litigation, she's less optimistic that Janet, that this can be fixed. She says the only way you can fix this is with a match and gasoline. And, and I think we can do reforms. I don't think we've got to burn the whole thing to the ground and start fresh. I think it can be fixed. But um, in order to fix it, we kind of have to have the context of what's going on now and, and what's been going on the past few years. And um, so I did a lot of FOIA work. I did some review of publicly available data and, and all of my FOIAs are basically like something happened to one of my clients and I'm mad about it. And so that's kind of how my FOIA process works. And so if it seems like my data are a bit disjointed, it's because uh, different clients got me mad about different things. And I try to piece it together in a way that makes sense. Um, and I, I'm pretty critical of the IRS. I think there's a lot of good people there. I think it's generally a bunch of good people trying to do their best. I also think they have a lot of a lot of bad systems in place, and I think good people in bad systems uh, tend to produce worse results than bad people in good systems. And so I think I think that's just kind of how we have to focus on this: is how what what results do these systems that are put in place res, uh, produce? And so the first you know the first little chart here is from a few different pubs, 55B, which is just how the IRS has shifted its focus. And this is kind of a guns and butter type of they're making. Uh, choices based on scarce resources and dwindling resources. And so uh, the yeah, that first chart is basically this is what's happened for our audits. The, the green line is EITC audits, the uh, orange is non-EITC. So from 2010, uh, we went from you know a pretty big uh, difference. There are a lot more orange than blue ones to uh, 2018, they've almost converged. And so that blue line is 17% of taxpayers. 
uh, and the orange one is is 83%. And that's how we're allocating our, our scarce budget of examinations. And so, I, I, again, I don't think anybody's you know sitting at the IRS trying to figure out how can we really stick it to low-income taxpayers. But I think this is just um, a result of the systems put in place where computers are spitting out letters. And uh, what that's resulted in is the next chart where you go from 2010, you're a little more than twice as likely to get audited if you're an EITC claimer to 2018, where you're four and a quarter times as likely to get audited. And so um, it's impossible to look at this without thinking about what actually happens when an audit starts. And, and Mandy did a great, a great job of describing that uh, in, in May during that panel. Um, but I think one of the most important things is to figure out, you know, there's a lot of discussion in that May panel about nudge theory and uh, how we can nudge people into good administration or good compliance. I think it's important to figure out how we nudge people out of getting credits they might actually be entitled to. And so when an audit starts, you've got between 40 and 45% of taxpayers aren't even gonna respond. And if you don't respond, you lose everything that's in question. And so we're now really disproportionately focusing on low-income taxpayers. We're, we've got a, you know, almost half of taxpayers who get audited don't respond, which means you know, everything that's in question gets reversed. And um, I, I'm gonna move on now to like some of the, you know, the ex clients that have actually seen you know, things affect. And so we've got data on who's being audited. And I think it's important to figure out how we're doing audits, what's being audited and um, how we can maybe change that. Cause I think, I think it's a bad system. Um, one of my most outrageous audits, uh, everybody knows the IRS destroyed 30 million information returns back in 2020, mostly 2019 1099s. So I've got a client who gets audited. He's got a, a 1099. That's the only income on the Schedule C. Well, the IRS says we don't have any record of that income. Um, taxpayer, just a model client, to be honest. These guys were great. Only income claimed was this Schedule C income. They provide a copy of the 1099 to the examiner. They provide a statement from the payer. They provide bank records showing deposits for roughly the amount claimed on the tax return. Examiner says, not good enough. We don't have a copy of the 1099 on file. And I'm, I'm pulling my what's left of my hair out, just trying to figure out what's going on here. And um, it, <laughs> what was most ridiculous, the examiner said, this is a joint bank account. Either of you could have deposited that money. Uh, joint with his wife, they filed a joint return. So I guess the, the theory could have been the, the husband lied about earning income and the, the wife lied about not earning income. What, just ridiculous. It had a happy ending. We petitioned tax court and opposing counsel was pretty good. Fortunately, I watched a presentation about asking for fees uh, you know, prior to closing out that, um, you know, that case. And we got fees on this case. So we got almost $4,000 worth of fees from the government for this. Um, but that made me think, how many people did this happen to? And so I said, hey, IRS, tell me how many people did you did you audit because there's a, a mismatch between Schedule C and the, your data for 2019, the year you destroyed 30 million re, uh, info returns? And they said, geez, we did that to 33,000 people. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I don't know how to contextualize that data. I better do a bunch more FOIA. So I did. And that is um, that's a, that's about three times the average year from 2012 to 2020. Uh, there's only one year that came close and it was 2017. Now, 2019 was about 2% higher. And in 2017, they did about 40% more EITC audits. So it's not really attributable to, you know, just random fluctuation. And I don't think they probably should have done any of these audits under that audit code, because how do they have any reliability that the taxpayer didn't earn that income? You know, my client earned income from the same payer 2016, 17, uh, 18, and 20. And the only one missing is 2019. So I thought, gosh, I better figure out, hey, guys, what did you do, IRS? What filters were in place for 2019? And they, they said, we're not going to tell you that. That's We got law enforcement exception to FOIA. I expected that result. Um, I wasn't surprised. I think there are some... Um, problematic accountability implications for that, especially when Nina's got these chats about how are we going to use AI to analyze data? Well, chances are good that once we start doing that, that's going to be a law enforcement technique that we aren't going to tell practitioners what, what we do. And so there's, there's going to be some accountability questions there. Um, and then the next two questions were kind of like, hey, I know you guys messed up on this. Just admit it. And so I said, can you tell me what you guys did to make sure this wouldn't happen? 
And they're like, oh man, we don't have any records of, of doing anything. Um, and then I said, well, at least tell me what kind of guidance you gave your examiners to explain to them why there might be an apparent mismatch between uh, Schedule C income for 2019 and uh, data that the IRS has on wage and income transcripts. And they said, oh, shucks, we didn't we didn't give them any guidance on this at all either, uh, or no responsive records is the, the real answer. And I, I talked to the FOIA officer and he's like, oh, yeah, I bet we didn't do anything. I bet we I bet we just kept this system the way it was without taking into account the fact that we destroyed 30 million documents that otherwise show income. Uh, that's that's kind of a, you know, a rare case. Um, but I think it demonstrates some of the examples of a system that's largely on autopilot, you know, computers just spitting out letters until they either assess or, um, and, you know, or they respond. And, and so I guess I wonder how many of these people who got audited because the IRS destroyed documents are among that 40 to 45% who didn't respond to the exam. Uh, I don't know the answer. Um, I, I asked for EITC specific data on response rates. They told me they didn't have any. Now it looks like Day had some of that data. So hopefully, you know, you can talk about that. Um, but this isn't the typical situation. The typical situation is the IRS has a bunch of data and they don't use it to narrow the scope of exam. And Mandy touched on this, you know, just the, the blanket letters that said, congratulations, you've been selected for audit. We're auditing everything. And, you know, if we're auditing the American Opportunity Tax Credit, provide us this. And the taxpayer sees that and like, what is that? I don't think I claim that. They got the wrong guy. Um, and so they send out really confusing letters and then they they audit things that they might have probably sufficient information or circumstantial evidence to say, yeah, maybe we shouldn't audit this when we know that 40 to 50 percent of taxpayers aren't going to respond. Um, so EITC exams, pretty common. You see them triggered by Schedule C issues. Uh, pretty common for me to see somebody claims 1099 income. They would write it as wage income. Well, that's probably right for the IRS to select that return for an audit because they're underreporting uh, self-employment income um, and they're overreporting income because of the self-employment income tax deduction for EITC. So it's right for the audit, IRS to select that return for audit. But is it right for the IRS to audit the residency uh, prong of the EITC? Um, and I'll just point to four pieces of information they may have on that on that taxpayer from you know other data sources. So they've got the taxpayer statement under penalty of perjury. I I, I presented this list of stuff to, to Caleb at the University of Minnesota and he thought, hey, that's not a very good one. And I, I agree, he's, he's probably right, but there, it's not worth nothing. It's gotta be given some weight. The taxpayer said I'm entitled to it. That's, it's gotta be, you know, probably not weighted heavily, but it's some evidence. Um, you've also got social security data saying this is the parent. You've got IRS data saying no one has ever claimed this child before except for the parent or, you know, sometimes even parents on a married filing joint return. So what is, why, who does the IRS think is claiming this kid or who should this, who should be claiming this kid? And I, I recently got, I FOIA'd an audit report and I saw in the IRS records, the statement, mother is custodial parent. That is in the IRS dependent database. Guess what? If mom doesn't prove that she's got the kid, uh, she doesn't meet the residency requirement, they're not going to treat her as the custodial parent. They're going to reverse the child tax credit and the earned in income tax credit. And I just thought, holy cow, we've got a computer who already knows this, sending this woman multiple letters, which she hadn't responded to until she came to our clinic. And I said, you know what? I bet this, I bet this uh, dependent database shows that she's the custodial parent. And sure enough, it did. Um, no, I think that dependent database is unreliable data, but the IRS doesn't, and the computer sure as heck doesn't know that that's not credible. So, you know, the uh, taxpayer has the obligation to introduce data that's credible to show that they're entitled to the credits. Well, if the taxpayer FOIA'd their record and sent it to the IRS, they would have introduced this data that the IRS already has, and they might be able to shift that burden. Um, because otherwise the IRS would be in the position of saying, well, yeah, but that federal case registry, that dependent database, that's not credible. And then the taxpayer could say, well, what do you mean it's not credible? You guys use that for all kinds of stuff. How are you arguing that your own database isn't credible? So I think that, you know, in this context, in a tax court case, and I don't think opposing counsel would fight you on it, but the problem is the default systems that we create, uh, which nudge taxpayers into getting these credits reversed, whether or not they should. Um, so that was some fast talking. My other... Uh, my other kind of crusade against the IRS has been on dupe TIN data, and this is a lot of e-file rejection, but it touches on, you know, it touches on audit statistics as well. 
Um, the IRS has been pushing e-file, you know, as much as they can for a decade or two decades now, and it's been successful. I mean, this is kind of the trend. You're, sh you're seeing a lot of e-file um, returns now, and they're cheap to process. Uh, so it's great. Awesome. We did that. But there's a problem. The IRS will reject a second e-file return that claims a dependent that has already been claimed on a prior e-file return, with three exceptions. Two of them have to do with earned income tax credit exams. Uh, first taxpayer got an EITC reversed recently, then they'll let the second one through. If the second taxpayer won an EITC exam, no change letter, then they'll let that one through. The third is the federal case registry exception, which we said the IRS uses that. They treat that data as credible for some purposes. This is one of them. They'll let that second tax return through if the FCR data show that that's um, you know, the custodial parent. Uh, more on that in a second. Um, so here is a shift to e-filing means that fewer people are filing paper by default, which means these paper returns that a taxpayer would have filed by default, they wouldn't have been rejected. But because taxpayers have been following the IRS advice and e-filing their returns, ta-da, your e-file return is rejected because you have done the thing we have asked you all to do. Um, which seems maybe a bit arbitrary that this shift in mechanism of filing has resulted in some very real results for taxpayers. And um, again, talking about um, talking about nudge theory and what's be you know how taxpayers are being nudged, this creates a really strong default effect uh, among taxpayers. And so I found in a, through a FOIA that fewer than twenty percent of these e-file rejections go on to file a paper return. Part of that is just this default bias. Part of it is the IRS tells taxpayers if your e-file return has been rejected, you must have made a mistake, fix the mistake. And I've had taxpayers who went to the leading tax prep software company in the world, you know, in the country, and they've said, take the kid off and file it. Can I file an amended return later? You cannot. And that was the advice they got. I've had VITA clients who've who've had this issue happen to them as well. Um, and so I think, you know, it's not very uh, satisfactory that they have this option to file a paper return that most most client or most taxpayers don't know about. I just got a 2013 amended return processed uh, uh, based on this dupe 10 issue. It's it's wild. And what really strikes me as odd is the IRS isn't actually auditing these dupe 10 returns based on another FOIA response. I said, how many audits are you doing of these dupe 10 taxpayers? I assumed it was through the roof. Um, in fact, very few audits are do being done on these dupe 10 paper returns that are sent in. And that means that, you know, this chart is kind of scary. The IRS is using that burdensome administrative process to prevent duplicate claims for the same kid. And so, you know, 2019, I think it was 133 times more likely that a taxpayer has the um, child tax credit or earned income tax credit reversed based on an e-file rejection where they never went on to file a paper return versus an audit where the IRS made a factual determination that they are not entitled to the, or maybe didn't make a factual determination. Maybe, you know, IRS or the taxpayer never responded, but, um, but this is the predominant mechanism they're using. And I think what's interesting is to the extent that a taxpayer were to file a paper return after this e-file rejection, particularly in, in, in the time of COVID where it's taking two years to process a paper return, that first return, that's probably gonna be a tax return under Fowler. And so if the IRS subsequently tries to you know, audit and assess, I think um, they might run into problems because they sat on this paper return for two years after somebody tried to e-file. Um, and if I'm wrong, that's fine. I'll, I'll be happy to be corrected in the comments later. But um, And the IRS is actually double crediting a ton of dupe 10 claims. This is another FOIA. I said, how many times are you double paying those credits? And they said, shoot, we're doing it a lot. Um, and so they're not auditing taxpayers based on this. They're auditing other taxpayers where there's no dupe 10 issue. And the IRS actually has reliable indicia that they are entitled to the, the EITC because they're not limiting the scope. And then they aren't doing single scope audits of these taxpayers who, you know, maybe the only question is residency. Where, where is the kid living? Um, and so just a quick word on the FCR data, and then I'll be, uh, I'll be done. Um, I don't think the FCR data actually does what the IRS says it does or Congress says it does. You know, Janet talked about it showing custodial parent. I don't think it does that. Um, the HHS says it doesn't, or at least they said it didn't back in 2020 or 2001 when the uh, IRS was first, you know, given authority to use this. Um, they sent out some exam soft notices saying, we, it looks like maybe you weren't entitled to claim this kid. 
maybe fix it. And then, you know, HHS sent out a, a memo to Title IV directors and said, oh gosh, the IRS is treating this uh, child support data as if it's custodial. You're going to have to tell them it's not, and it's going to be awkward. Um, and then I recently got a response from the, uh, the Florida Department of Revenue, which manages our state case registry and reports the federal case registry. And I'm like, I said, guys, are you, um, are you tracking and reporting custody or time sharing information? And they said, no, we absolutely are not. And the form that California uses, the California courts use on these child support cases uh, for their state case registry, which you know feeds into the federal case registry, it doesn't track custody. And so what's important is in Florida, pretty common for a family court judge to say, we're going to do 50-50 time sharing. Oh, hey, mom, you made more money. You're going to pay child support to dad because uh, we want to make sure the, cat, the kid has access to resources, no matter which parent you know, he's staying with at the time. Well, anybody who knows 152 and the tiebreaker rules there, they know that, that that means the IRS is going to have custody information that is actually contrary to the, the tiebreaker rule in 152. Um, and I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the IRS has some access to some data other than, you know, they're getting from the state case registries. I think they don't. I don't actually, you know, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I've got a, a FOIA with HHS to get some data from them. But at, what that might mean is that the IRS doesn't actually have math error authority to reverse these EITC claims. There's been much wailing and gnashing of teeth. Is the IRS ever going to exercise this math error authority? I don't know that they've got it. Um, it seems like if they don't have custody information based on the federal case registry, well, then they can't do a math error based on custody. So it might be premised on a flawed, pre you know, flawed premise. Um, so those are some systems that I think are put in place that might not be good. And um, hopefully it'll be time to discuss. Yeah, you know, I think that your conversation about the federal case registry, this is something that that you know, I was there in 2001 and raised concerns, and that's when the legislative language came. The you know, in the in the committee report saying um, Treasury needs to do a study in conjunction with the National Taxpayer Advocate about the accuracy and wage and investment research did that study. Jen, I think, was reviewing it, and it showed you know some real problems just in the accuracy. And some of the problems were that the data was so inconsistent. Some states weren't using it. Some states were using it. Um, you know, how often were they updated? And I had no problem myself using it as an indicator, like that's something that you should look at, but not as a, an on-off switch and math error. And I think that discomfort continues today, and you've just shown even more. Um, I do so want to say, oh, Janet wants to weigh in here on that. Yeah. Actually, the study was never completed because there was a problem with which the IRS collected data on it. Yeah. So we stepped back from the study yeah. from the analysis because the, the data was problematic, not because of what it was showing, but because they really, the way they did it was they had, by the time they got to the West Coast, they really had very, very, very little, few cases in their sample. We were aware with the legislation that using math error authority for this and for another provision was really stretching the frontier as to whether math error, error authority was appropriate. I mean, we had done it with the SSN requirements because showing the existence of the child, showing the age of the child, which was information you got from the SSN data, was presumed to be really reliable and hence could be used with some good conscience for you know, the more expedient math error authority. There was less of that certainty when this legislation got enacted for giving the IRS math error authority. There was a little bit more desperation at the time <laughs> as to what else could be done. And that was why in addition to giving the IRS the authority, there was also the requirement to do the study, but then the study was not correctly done. We stood, we, we stood back from the data, refused to go any further with using it. And, you know, Nina was making a good case about why it shouldn't be used. We didn't want to have it used without the study. And so 
unless something has happened in the years since Nina left, and certainly in the years since I left, they're not using the data. And I don't think in good conscience, they would want to use that data for math their authority. With respect to the duplicates, it was my understanding back in the day, and again, I've not been at Treasury for 15 years, but back in the day, the understanding was, I mean, you're right in terms of the treatment of the electric, uh, the e-filed e returns that, that could be rejected because the IRS did not consider it a real return when there were relatively few of them being filed. That obviously has changed. But the notion was that when it got to the actual processing, that the dupes would not be denied in the first year that there was a duplicate, duplicate but that a soft notice would be sent to both taxpayers who had claimed the EITC for the child after the filing season, and that there would be, you know, get your act in order, essentially would be what the soft notices would say. You work it out with the other person, so forth. And then if there was a problem the following year, then it might become subject to an audit. But mm -hmm. there was recognition that the first person claiming the child may not be the right person. And so they wanted to go easy. On yeah. That. And, and I've actually asked them for a study. Again, one of these things where I don't think they've done one. So I said, guys, show me what data you have showing that the first person to file is more likely. They sent me, I mean, I've submitted that same FOIA a few times in worded different ways. The first response they said, you're, you're a kook. You're one of these sovereign citizen kooks who's questioning the constitutionality of the tax. I, what? Okay, sure. I'll rephrase. Uh, <laughs> but no, I think they are e-file rejecting these. That's what the Internal Revenue Manual says. The, the ERM still yeah. says we're going to yeah. send us an exam soft notice if, yeah. you know, I guess if it gets through. Um, yeah, I think, I think that, um, I think that, you know, the other development, and then I want to get on today, the other development that's happened since Janet, but, you know, you were here is that, uh, Justin referenced the Fowler opinion in the tax court, but that is a presidential tax court opinion that said that a return that is filed and meets the beard requirements of what is a return, when it's e filed, it is actually a return. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, and so that and that's something that we've really been pressing the IRS on. These are actual returns. And um, you need to change your e-filing yeah, system. Yeah, to yeah. Them. And then maybe to go to your point about shooting out two soft notices, you get two of them, you shoot out soft notices. And that's what use of a machine to do that, even as you're processing that return and determining with more sophisticated filters, whether this is a taxpayer we should be worried about, or it was the first one we should, should have been worried about what we didn't have a competing return when that one was filed. I want to get to some of the questions um, and then to today, um, you know, there was a question about statistics and, you know, where is, where do, do these numbers fit with all of the numbers? Uh, you can certainly go to the IRS data book and Janet has written extensively about this. I've done blogs on procedurally taxing, showing where we are with audits. The National Taxpayer Advocate has done this information in, in you know, the most recent annual reports, including past ones. The other thing that I would say is that, you know, when you look at, and this goes to Janet's early point about, you know, how somehow in the 90s, because you didn't have the tax compliance measurement program, the random audit program generating, re, you know, really good solid numbers, it was prohibited. The only compliance, real serious compliance work was EITC, and it made EITC errors look really disproportionately the game in town. When you look at the IRS's own numbers on the tax gap, you know, I've published bar charts where, you know, EITC overclaims even how they are, you know, that how they are measured today, you know, they're like a pimple on that bar chart compared to, for example, Schedule C yeah. or unreported business, you know, unincorporated business income. It's not where the tax gap is. Um, and yet it is disproportionately audited vis-a-vis -vis its share of the tax gap. Um, the other question, which was sent to me as a direct message, is why can't the IRS prove the client that the client is not the parent? Why does the burden, or is the parent, why does the burden have to be on the taxpayer? Well, the tax law, the tax code says the burden of proof is on the taxpayer, 
unless Congress says otherwise. But that shouldn't stop the IRS from, I think that's our point, is that, you know, using data that you do have, and it's not just one piece of data, but, you know, in a way, if you have a lot of data, then you get a better perspective of what's really going on there and using historical data and trying to paint a picture of what's going on here. You could accept things that are, I think, Justin, yesterday you used that, you know, it's the preponderance of the evidence. It's not clear and convincing. So to sort of go today, I want to read from a 1999, March 1999 GAO study. And it is called IRS Audits, Weaknesses in Selecting and Conducting Correspondence Audits. And this is just a paragraph that GAO wrote back in March 1999. Second, the work papers for the 1996 correspondence audit showed that up to about one third of the audits had little or no evidence of how the tax examiner did the audit or supported any recommended taxes. IRS's manual requires that tax examiners adequately support their audit recommendations and document that support in the audit work paper files. Analyses show that the less time spent on the audit, the less documentation appeared in the work papers. When supporting documentation is lacking, it can create uncertainty about the additional taxes recommended in those audits. And that was when people were doing one-on-one -on -one audits. So you know, when you move to next available assister, you get, when you're just on a call and you're seeing another call coming up, your audits, your notes to the next next available assister are really skimpy. So day, you have a whole bunch of stuff you can touch on, have at it. <laughs> well, um, so first, I just want to say uh, thank you very much for uh, for including me on this panel. Um, you know, it's been great to to uh, hear all the comments on the historical perspective uh, from from Janet and uh, really uh, like the LITC and, and personal uh, kind of interactions that that you described, Justin, like are, are also very helpful. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of coming at this more from like a research uh, background and uh, some of the work that I've done with uh, colleagues at the IRS in uh, the research analysis, uh, applied an on analytics and statistics groups. Um, so this is work with uh, Brenda Schaefer, uh, John Guyton, uh, Mark Payne, and uh, Kara Lee Bell at, uh, at IRS in, in RAS, and uh, with Ankur Patel at the Office of Tax Analysis at Treasury. So when we started looking into uh, correspondence audits, you know, I, I think, well, one thing I should start off with was, um, you know, I was just blown away uh, with the distinction between correspondence versus in-person audits. Um, if, you know, if many of you are tax walks like me, uh, you've probably seen the movie Stranger Than Fiction. Um, it's uh, with Will Ferrell and Maggie Gyllenhaal. Um, Will Ferrell audits Maggie Gyllenhaal's uh, small business, um, a bakery wonderful rom-com, but also really gives you a, a good sense of an in-person audit. So to learn about correspondence audits and, and pieces that are just being conducted entirely over uh, mail was, was really kind of eye-opening to me. And the idea that these are about you know, 300 to 500,000 uh, audits uh, each year was, was also very eye-opening. You know, I, I wanna start off by saying you know, this is um, the, the EITC, you know, it's uh, around $80 billion, uh, reaching about 30 million tax units every year. Um, you know, doing very well and, and been hailed as a success in, in many ways. And, and, you know, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's relatively low administrative burden for most individuals, but when you have 300 to 500,000 individuals each year going through a correspondence audit, that, that is a pretty sizable uh, population. So in our study, we looked at um, audits from 2008 to 2015. Um, we wanted to uh, look at long-term impacts, which is why we uh, stopped uh, the, the analysis with people that were audited in 2015. But the, these uh, statistics that I'm about to give you uh, kind of run uh, pretty consistently across uh, audit years. So um, the first eye-opening result, uh, I think, was just documenting uh, audit outcomes. So about 75% of uh, EITC correspondence audits resulted in uh, disallowances. Uh, and these were default disallowances. And what I mean by that is um, individuals had their EITC or their, uh, uh, their um, uh, refunds disallowed because of uh, um, they did not uh, provide a response to the audit uh, at all. Now, some of this, uh, I think we want to break down. So of the 75%, if we can break that down, about 15%, about 10 to 15% of uh, audit notices were not delivered. So this was an undelivered mail outcome. This is uh, tracked uh, within uh, the IRS. Um, you know, and 
Yeah, it's, you know, we talked about people, you know, like their emotions when they're notified about uh, being audited. Some individuals didn't even get to that stage. They were just um, sort of not notified and did not even know that they were under audit because they never received a notification. Um, beyond that, then you have about 45% of individuals that never responded uh, to the audit. So the notice was delivered, but uh, about 45% uh, of individuals just never responded. Um, you know, I think that that's pretty eye-opening because as you, you know, from a research perspective, if we're trying to document non-compliance uh, versus, um, you know, taxpayer confusion, and, and we want to distinguish uh, those two kind of factors here, with non-response, we're, we're not getting there. Um, and so that creates a difficulty to just understand uh, confirmed non-compliance. So about another 15% of individuals had insufficient responses and um, uh, they, that resulted in a default outcome. So about three quarters of all audits are resulting in the uh, default outcome. About 15% of uh, audits uh, resulted in um, responses and then um, there were disallowances. Um, the, the taxpayer agreed. Um, so um, the remaining 10% is uh, the no change or the uh, EITC was allowed. So relatively few uh, individuals, um, you know, about 90% of individuals have uh, disallowances, about 10% of individuals have uh, partial or uh, full allowances. Partial allowances are, are relatively low. So most of that is uh, the allowances are full um, uh, allowances. So that was really uh, just eye-opening to start with about understanding the responses and, uh, you know, trying to see who is uh, a documented non-compliant uh, claim uh, versus a uh, sort of a confused uh, taxpayer. Um, and we couldn't dis, uh, disentangle uh, those those two pieces. Then, uh, you know, in our research design, we wanted to compare uh, individuals that were selected for audit with observationally identical individuals that were not selected for audit. And it turns out for relatively low or moderate risk uh, correspondence audits, there is some random selection. So uh, you can fix a certain um, set of audit characteristics. And within that bucket, there's some random selection so that we can compare uh, individuals that are, um, you know, had similar uh, uh, potential noncompliance um, on their tax returns with people that were selected for, for audit um, and, and people that were not selected for audit. That gives us a research design uh, to then look at longer term outcomes. And one of the biggest uh, uh, subsequent outcomes, I think, from the audit process was uh, we see a large uh, increase in non-filing in future years after the audits. So one, I think one of the most common responses, and this is a very large, um, about, um, uh, about a 30% uh, decrease in filing rates um, out the years following um, the, uh, the uh, correspondence audits. Now, uh, you know, not filing is pretty significant uh, because you also see individuals leaving withholdings on the table. So individuals that have, um, you know, their, uh, so aside from any tax credits, um, just, you know, any withholdings um, that they could have claimed if they were um, uh, below the filing threshold, for example, uh, we see that, um, we, we see that uh, left on the table as well. We also see, uh, as you might imagine, kind of consistent with this uh, decreases in uh, EITC participation. And then uh, another uh, kind of aspect that follows from non-filing is that the children that were claimed on the return that was audited end up either uh, not showing up on any tax returns or they show up on uh, other people's tax returns. Um, so you do see both uh, unclaimed increases in unclaimed uh, children, um, as well as child switching. And, um, you know, potentially, you know, that could be, uh, you know, uh, some of this is, uh, as we were talking about earlier, these are now switching to maybe the appropriate uh, parent is claiming uh, the child, but we also see uh, some children not being claimed at all. And, and that could be uh, along the lines of individuals were eligible or they had a qualifying child that was eligible, um, uh, would have made them eligible for the EITC, but they didn't file. So again, it's hard to disentangle these pieces just given the available uh, outcome data from the audits. We also see decreases in employment. So in some individuals were less likely to have uh, a W-2 in future years. Uh, this kind of starts to speak to some of the uh, you know, successes of the EITC in encouraging labor force participation. On the other hand, if you disallow the EITC, um, you know, potentially uh, reducing incentives for participation in labor force also shows up. So all of this, I think, kind of, um, you know, this research, I, I think, kind of speaks to a lot of the, uh, you know, kind of uh, personal experiences that uh, and, and the uh, FOIA request that Justin was speaking to. And, and you know, the historical context of how we got here, um, you know, is, is also very relevant, as, as Janet mentioned. But I also kind of want to uh, segue to kind of think about, well, what can we do uh, going forward? And um, this is where I think some of the ideas that uh, Nina and I have been uh, discussing and trying to develop into a, a research proposal uh, come into play. 
So one uh, kind of piece, I think, first off, um, you know, I, I want to kind of describe a suite of potential uh, strategies that can be uh, implemented. It could be one or all of these strategies. Um, and I think feedback on these strategies, uh, you know, we're all, all, all ears. So, um, you know, we kind of want to work with what we have to try to improve uh, outcomes. One idea I think that we've already touched on is uh, plain language uh, notifications. So just giving individuals a clear uh, understanding of what they need to do. Uh, what, so one, that they are under audit and two, uh, what they need to do. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, uh, if you look at current uh, audit notices, uh, these um, drafts, I think, have been shared in uh, prior tax drafts. There's also examples in uh, the paper uh, that, um, that that I'm discussing. But um, we we provide uh, you know a, a, the next step of uh, submit documentation to verify your tax return. But I think we could go a step further to say, okay, so here's how you can verify um, that your small business exists, or uh, here's how you can verify that uh, this qualifying child meets the eligibility conditions. To give you an example, I didn't know that a pediatrician's note or a note from a school or a teacher or a principal could verify a child uh, residency in some cases. But um, you know, examples of that I think would be very useful on the notices. It also kind of gets us to a point where um, the IRS can hopefully give guidance to taxpayers, and that tax uh, that uh, guidance can be uniform across taxpayers. So it's not a lottery of who do you, which examiner you get, and which examiner uh, you kind of you know uh, missed out on, um, you know, and, and didn't give you guidance. Related to uh, the notifications. Um, notifying individuals could also be uh, uh, helpful in the cases of undelivered mail. So thinking about outbound phone calls or, um, you know, not using um, just the one address, but seeing if there are other potential addresses that we can identify for, for a taxpayer. So really trying to close that uh, ten, the 10 to 15 percent of undelivered mail and getting that to 100 percent of individuals have been notified uh, of their uh, audit selection. Um, the next uh, kind of thought on, on this, I think, uh, really, um, you know, uh, it's great to have Justin on this call because uh, thinking about um, referring individuals to LITCs and, uh, you know, thinking about virtual audit assistance. Right now, we have VITA if you need to file a tax return. But after tax filing season, um, when these audits come up, there, you know, individuals might need some uh, assistance and referring individuals to uh, LITCs could be very helpful. Or um, if they could even set up a virtual audit uh, assistance. So maybe you can make an appointment with an examiner, um, you know, online and at least like talk through uh, to get some guidance. Um, you know, it might not be the examiner that uh, handles your case directly, but at least you get uh, some in-person assistance um, to, to kind of clarify what exactly uh, the next steps are. And then I think we, um, you know, the, another piece here in this proposal is to really prioritize distinguishing between non-response and uh, non-compliance, or we want to move to prioritizing confirmed outcomes. As I mentioned, about 75% of uh, outcomes from the audits are uh, uh, disallowances that are due to defaults. Um, it's hard to say that this is then non-compliance uh, directly without the assumption of, well, uh, this person responded uh, or, the, you know, and so they probably were eligible or this person didn't respond, so they probably weren't eligible. Those are assumptions that I think, you know, ideally we'd like to know, uh, you know, this is a confirmed case of non-compliance. And so uh, prioritizing that confirmed outcome instead of uh, the, uh, the default outcomes, I think could be, uh, could be pretty, pretty useful. Um, next, I think kind of related to uh, this one strategy to dis, uh, distinguish between uh, non-response and uh, non-compliance could be trying to understand the impact of the correspondence process itself versus an in-person uh, uh, audit process. So you could, uh, you know, imagine that you have the same individuals that are being audited. One individual goes through a correspondence process. One person goes through the in-person process, um, the Will Ferrell, uh, you know, kind of stranger than fiction process. And, you know, potentially like those two different, um, you know, processes are going to have uh, different outcomes. But I think we want to compare those outcomes and understand why. Um, you know, maybe it's the uh, the humanity of personal engagement. Maybe it's uh, the inhumanity of the uh, um, correspondence process. Uh, but we kind of need to understand how the audit process itself is driving outcomes. Um, and then that can help us uh, sort of like, you know, move to uh, uh, getting a, a better outcomes or getting uh, more engagement from taxpayers to get to those confirmed outcomes. Finally, I think uh, in the audit pipeline, you know, I think uh, we've talked about uh, the beginning of the pipeline with notices and kind of getting people through uh, to confirmed outcomes. The last piece of the pipeline that I would emphasize is after audits are complete or uh, cases are closed, 
following up with taxpayers uh, with post audit uh, or post disallowance uh, educational uh, information. So letting taxpayers know what they should be doing uh, to do things correctly or that they could still potentially file and claim EITC in future years if they're eligible. Um, you know, so following up with these individuals that are now more likely uh, to not file and potentially going into hiding or like, you know, not, um, you know, uh, filing and claiming their withholdings, letting them know with a notice, um, you know, or a soft touch notice, here's, um, you know, how you can, uh, you know, correctly file uh, in the future. If we do refer individuals to filing the 8862 form, um, you know, and we're funneling people to paper returns, maybe we can see how we could uh, still, you know, uh, refer them to e-filing resources that can accept the uh, 8862 forms as well. Um, the last couple pieces, you know, I think we've talked about developing better data and better using the data better to get it at filing uh, filters and, and at filing resolution. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, that would be um, sort of uh, where we want to move to, uh, you know, kind of broadly um, with the with the whole correspondence audit process. And then relatedly, I would say. Uh, thinking about an audit uh, working group would be very valuable. So, um, you know, uh, Nina and myself have uh, talked to folks at the IRS and, and Treasury about these ideas. Um, you know, I think having folks like uh, Justin from uh, LITCs, from uh, folks from uh, Vita sites, um, you know, uh, Janet has a lot of experience on this as well. So kind of combining uh, an audit working group uh, or bringing together people in an audit working group from all of these different areas, as well as Treasury and the IRS could really uh, shed light on what is going on and get word out about how we can improve the process and, uh, you know, kind of share thoughts here. So all of these uh, ideas, you know, I think uh, it's it's uh, sort of a suite of ideas to try to think about improving uh, core audit processes. I know the IRS's uh, strategic operating plan has really prioritized this, um, you know, so work is underway, but I also think that, um, you know, hopefully uh, collaborating on some of these ideas could be very useful uh, since, you know, we can bring uh, expertise, you know, both from an academic statistics side, personal experience, uh, and, and, you know, the, uh, knowing the history of the processes here. Um, you know, so combining all of this expertise, I think, could make those current efforts uh, much more uh, impactful uh, and could potentially even lead to new efforts as well. So I'll stop there. And again, you know, I just want to say thanks. Um, I also want to uh, emphasize thanks to the folks at the IRS and Treasury. I do think that the EITC is a program that is uh, largely successful, but I, I think uh, there are areas uh, that can be improved as well. Uh, so happy to have uh, further discussion on all of these uh, all of these points. Yeah, you know, I think what's thank you, Day. I think that's a really, you know, I really like how you pivoted to, you know, where do we go going forward? And I think, you know, that's where I want to wrap up this conversation with. I I personally, you know, believe that that, you know, the Irish should touch all different aspects of tax filing and tax positions. And so I would never advocate that it should not be doing touches to the EITC. CTC population. But what you want out of any of those touches, whether it's a, you know, letter, a soft letter, or it's an educational letter, or it's an audit, is you want the taxpayer to understand what they did wrong, if they did something wrong, or they understand what the IRS is asking so that they can go back to the IRS and say, you know, you don't understand. This is my information and I am entitled to this. And, and, you know, my dedication to that is that that is fundamental due process, that the whole legal concept of due process is rested on the recognition back to the Magna Carta, for heaven's sakes, that, you know, government's power gets things wrong. And so you have to give notice to the person you're acting against, that the government is acting against, as to what you want them to do and what you think they did wrong. And then the other half of due process is give them an opportunity to come in and say, you got this wrong, government. And when you look at the core exam process as it currently is, and there's lots of reason to understand how it got there, and I think Janet's background is just fundamental to understanding this, is that, you know, there's so much better what we could do in the core exam process. And I think the IRA funding, you know, this has been my question, and Janet 
hosted a, a panel at Tax Policy Center on IRA funding, the strategic operating plan. And, you know, we spent a lot of time focusing on what the enforcement dollars are going to do with the over 400,000 population. And my question always was, what, okay, you're not going to audit the under 400,000, but what are you doing to improve the experience of the below 400,000 people who, even if you do it at the historical levels, it's, you it's really needs to change. So that's my question to you all. You know, Day sort of talked about, you know, his proposal. So maybe I'll go to Jenna and then Justin and Dale give you the last final word. But Jenna, well, what would you want to see going forward? You know, it's interesting that last point you made because the word enforcement is broad. Yeah. And some former commissioners have commented on that. Um, and it's unfortunate too, because that spills into how the budget functions are. Yeah. That a pool of money goes into enforcement, a pool of money goes into taxpayer services. Um, and in IRA, in, in the Inflation Reduction Act, over half the money went to the budget area called enforcement and only a sm the smallest amount went into taxpayer services. But I keep thinking that, you know, in the case of wealthy taxpayers, and big corporations, there are ways for them to get pre-filing guidance from the IRS. And is there anything, and I don't know, I suspect maybe that, I don't know where that money comes out of, but it doesn't really matter. But is there ways of building up systems where before a taxpayer files a return, they can get comparable kinds of assistance and say, here are, here are the facts and circuit. I mean, I know this is difficult for lower income taxpayers without the resources and so forth, but is there sort of like a pre vita where people can come in and say, here are my facts and circumstances. Will this meet what the IRS is looking for in terms of qualifying child? What documentation should I have ready and so forth to, you know, help minimize the number of audits based on audits targeted people who really were qualified? Well, you know, when I was national taxpayer advocate, one of the recommendations we made was if you're really trying to prevent problems from occurring, you should have a year round toll free line just dedicated to family status issues. So EITC, CTC, AOTC. But, you know, who gets the child? And taxpayers could call in and at least just what you're saying, talk through. And I thought for the investment, it probably come, you know, could be coming from enforcement as a way to reduce audits downstream. But, uh, you know, they were just, you can see the written response. We have a fine toll-free line and it's like, no, 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 you didn't understand what we were saying. And I think, and we've actually recommended that again to Treasury in our comments on the strategic operating plan, that that's a real way to, to educate taxpayers. So Justin, where are you? You know, I think Mandy uh, had a lot of good points uh, in May when she said the IRS needs to re-envision how it does audits. I think um, I would love to see something like some of the Social Security Administration uh, statements that they are non-adversarial. Uh, at least if they're, we're talking about benefits administration, I would like to see it non-adversarial. I think that would improve inferences, inferences that examiners are drawing. You know, and, and I, it seems like they're always drawing inferences adverse to a taxpayer um, in the absence of uh, clear documentary evidence. Um, and so I think re-envisioning what audits look like also means using data for good as well as evil. It seems like the IRS can only use their data for evil uh, in that they're only using it against taxpayers. They should use their data to limit the scope of exams so that, you know, in these default processes, the worst case scenario isn't we're going to reverse everything, even though we think you probably are entitled to these things. And so, and, and I think if you change the notices to express clearly what's being audited, how many times did practitioners get calls saying, uh, the IRS sent me a math error notice about economic impact or recovery rebate credits. I didn't make over $75,000 because $75,000 was the first thing in this long disjunctive list of reasons why you may have had this uh, recovery rebate credit reversed. And usually it was because they already got the EIP, but they're not communicating clearly. And so when their uh, or correspondence exams talk about the American Opportunity Tax Credit, and the, really the only thing is, did you have the Schedule C income? 
And because of that, we're expanding the audit to did the kid live with you? It should just be a Schedule C narrow scope exam, and it should be clearly communicated what we'll say. Anyway, uh, change how we do exams, change how we communicate in exams, use the data for good as well as evil. Um, that's my, <laughs> that's, that's my so, soapbox rant. That's, that's really fun. That's good. Okay, so Day, you get the last word. Oh, uh, well, uh, that, that's very kind of you. But, um, you know, I think that, uh, yeah, my my thoughts here kind of uh, build on, um, you know, what every, uh, everyone has, has already touched on. You know, um, I think that I think of the, um, you know, the audit process or just, uh, you know, admin tax administration broadly and maybe in, in public policy administration broadly. I think we have to focus uh, or think about trust in government. And, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, it, like if a taxpayer is audited, uh, do they have the trust in the IRS that they will get through the process and, and get to the right outcome? Um, will they be given the opportunity to get to the right outcome? Um, I'm an optimist, but uh, I'm not quite sure that uh, all taxpayers that are audited would say that uh, they have trust in the process. I think some might not, and that is unfortunate. And but I think that we need to really address, uh, you know, the trust in the in, uh, process or get to re envisioning or rethinking the process so that taxpayers have that trust. Um, you know, uh, Justin mentioned, like, you know, we we really protect taxpayer data. Uh, we have a lot of trust in the uh, privacy of uh, taxpayer data. But I think at the same time, using data and giving taxpayers the opportunity to get to the correct outcome is really uh, crucial here. And, and I think uh, shifting from a, um, you know, uh, to a non-adversarial uh, kind of approach, uh, um, you know, it shouldn't be that fundamental, ideally, but hopefully uh, there are ways to do this. I think um, you know the direct file kind of efforts or online accounts could be a potential uh, kind of relation here that you know maybe one of the biggest factors here if uh, people are online is that they can also get um, you know additional um, avenues of communication for uh, you know what they're being audited on or what the IRS can already verify and um, maybe that could sort of help improve this process uh, in addition to just being another way to file it might actually be transformative for actually uh, resolving audits and uh, getting people through the pipeline. So, um, but broadly speaking, I think the, the focus on uh, non-adversarial approaches and, uh, you know, kind of moving to uh, confirmed outcomes and building trust in government uh, should be a broad focus here. And I think that if we start with that, um, you know, as, as Janet mentioned, you know, historically, IRS examiners were not um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, thrilled with being put in this position of uh, auditing low-income taxpayers. If they are in this position, I think most people, uh, you know, they would like, as, as Justin mentioned, you have good people with like bad systems. We can try to improve these systems uh, to, to get to good people and good systems. I think to that last point, the center has been funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to conduct um, ethnographic interviews with IRS employees um, doing correspondence exam and also answering the phones to sort of see, capture how they're feeling and also hearing what their recommendations would be. And I, I'm really looking forward to that. We'll be doing that over the next year, working with the union. Um, and I just want to point out, you know, when Justin said about, you know, um, the inferences that employees make, I think that what's really important here that as when I as a former administrator and head of office in the IRS, I really before I became that position, I really didn't understand the impact of this, which is performance measures. You know, what does the what does the organization report that funnels down to how employees are evaluated and, you know, they as Charles Rosati used to say to me all the time, you know, the good thing about IRS employees is they follow instructions. The bad thing about IRS employees is they follow instructions, you know? And so if you tell them, if they read, you're going to be measured on this, then that's what they're going to focus on. And so some of that, you have to hold that to the highest levels of the organization to set measures that then drive the behavior that you want to get and drive the non-adversarial behavior. Um, and that's going to be a subject of our in-person, our, our day-long conferences, really focusing on, we've had all these conversations, how do you get there? 
you know. Um, Nina, actually, uh, on that point, I just wanted to mention, and maybe one of the uh, comments uh, from Jennifer Gardner uh, in, in Arkansas, you know, she mentioned, uh, you know, verifying residency. Um, you know, I think that, uh, as, as uh, you know, if examiners were given guidance on how to verify residency, or if there's recognition on this is an inherently difficult uh, piece to to actually verify, then you start you know kind of speaking to okay, like you know, should we be thinking of regulatory change? Should we be thinking of uniform guidance uh, that doesn't have um, you know uh, the um, you know the, the sort of scope for interpretation, and you kind of win the lottery with a, one examiner that would let you through versus another examiner that doesn't. Um, and I, I completely agree with you that, uh, you know, these are areas that I think uh, we want to move to like a non-adversarial uniform uh, kind of way. And maybe some of that is just through these like improvements in the audit process. Maybe some of this is uh, through thinking about regulatory change or at least like, um, you know, uh, kind of thinking about those possibilities, but uh, totally on board with your thoughts. So just in well, closing, oh, Justin, did you want well, to- I was going to say about the performance measures, I, a recent audit, I-, I they said taxpayer claimed twelve thousand dollar refund. Um, the IRS said zero, and then we got to thirteen, and they're like, "Shut it down. We're not. We're not going to take any more evidence from you. The audit's over because you've already shown you're you're entitled to more than what you claimed. We're shutting it down." I'm like, "Well, we're not done. You know, we're we're entitled to fourteen thousand. Let's make that determination. Nope, we shut it down." Um, and so I, you know, I think they just if their performance measures are based on audits where they recover assets, they're shutting it down when we've already determined they're not going to. Well, and the earn not, part- not directly based on that because that yeah. would be a violation of law, but well, <laughs> there's lots of ways to get right. it across to people. And, I and earn part four doesn't yeah. seem to tell examiners that the burden is more likely than not, except for in a few instances, not the general rule. So I don't think they even know that that's the standard they should be applying. So I don't- Right. So um, I just want to close by saying I really want to thank our guests today. This has been a great program, and anyone who works in the field of EITC should watch it. Um, we'll have the video up eventually. We're sort of a couple of weeks behind. Um, the other thing is that our next um, tax chat, since we've been talking about the notices and their lack of clarity, is on notices and taxpayer communications. And so that's going to be on July 11th. And we will have Julie Payne from the IRS Transformation Office. We're going to have Michael Hallsworth, who is with the Behavioral Insight Team from UK that has done some of the leading work on nudge notices, but also just on some behavioral insights of using notices in a positive way rather than to you know, just collect more money. Um, and then Josh Beck from the Taxpayer Advocate Service, who worked on a lot of the recommendations over the years about how to improve notice clarity. So um, this is going to be a great program coming up. We've just had a great chat. And I want to thank you all. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. So, okay. Bye.